Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. Well, this week we have a mysterious unboxing. There's not a lot of labels going on here, but uh, you are definitely going to be excited about this. We're talking about how open source has kind of come together to bring us something that is really rocking my world right now. We're going to just kind of check things out. Yeah to see what's inside this box. We've also got a game that is celebrating 35 years, and we're gonna show you how you can install it on any Linux computer in under three seconds. Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit our website, Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's so great to have you here. Sasha and I are here. Nice yes, to see you. Nice to see you. Ready to rock this thing for the next yeah. hour? Oh, yeah. Are you ready? This is going to be fun. Uh, we've got a lot to cover tonight. Of course, we've got a really exciting unboxing <gasps> of a very plain looking box for you this week. So boring looking, that box. It is so it's boring. Not boring. You nailed on that <laughs> on the inside. I assure you, it's something that's going to get us really, <laughs> really excited. Also, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, well, a particular game from the retro era, and mm. uh, you want to stick around for that. But nice to see everybody. It's nice to have you here um, this week again. Uh, we are joined by our Discord community. So these are folks that are um, participating in the live show, which happens on a Wednesday night at seven o'clock Eastern. Time. So we are located in Barrie, Ontario, just north of Toronto. Beautiful city here. If you're visiting this summer, make sure you stop in, say hi here at the studio. Make sure you pop us an email, let us know you're on your way. <laughs> And we would love to have you join us. Uh, but our Discord channel is powered by something called Titan. And in fact, it's a software application that is open source. And uh, Titan Embeds has been made into what I call Titan Pie. Mm -hmm. And I've been talking about this for several weeks now as right. I've been kind of developing it and letting it run. And, and so now it's at the point, Titan Pie is at the point where it just runs. Right. That's exactly where you want your server software to be, folks. So if you remember back when we used to use Titan Embeds, well, sometimes this would get locked up. So the chat would stop it working would and we'd have to stop the show and go over and restart the feed and everything else. Mm-hmm. Does not happen anymore. No. And I haven't restarted this thing. I haven't done anything with it. Right. In six weeks. Yeah. That about sounds that. about right. Mm -hmm. What I've done is I've taken the open source software from Titan Embeds, put it into a Raspberry Pi uh, build of Debian Buster. So it's oh. Debian 10, which you can get on my blog, baldnerd.com. If you click on uh, single board computing, you'll see that there are um, build bases there. And so I've created um, build bases for multiple different for um, uh, SBCs, single board mm -hmm. computers, Raspberry Pi being one of them. and with that, then I took and I compiled this software from Titan Embeds. So it's open source. This is what's so beautiful about open source software, right? Yeah. It's like they have a server. They've made it publicly available and it's free to use. And I encourage you to try it out if you're into Discord. But it was problematic on the air. Right. So I said, well, let's try to do this locally. If I was to put this locally, would it be a little more successful? And it has been. Yeah. So on, now, th there's a reason I call it Titan Pie, Sasha. Any guesses? Nope. None? Because it's on a pie? It is okay. literally <laughs> on a Raspberry Pi microcomputer. Awesome. So it's running on a Raspberry Pi 3 microcomputer, which is just like a dirt cheap little like S itty single bitty board like computer. Like yeah. yeah, and I've got that thing running 24-7 for the past six weeks, running this Titan Embeds Titan Pi that I've created, mm -hmm. and it's been flawless. So if you are interested in that, hey, send me an email live at category5.tv, and I'm 
pretty much at this point prepared to release that publicly because it's been working so flawlessly. It's been working so well. Um, and I think that that's a, a really great project. So it just kind of shows Sasha and community how open source is really an incredible way to distrib distribute software. Right. Titan Embeds has done all the work. Mm -hmm. I've done a little You've, bit of work. Yeah. I've I contributed. Took I, my contribution, Sasha, is just taking what they've created yeah. and made it work on a Raspberry Pi, made it so that it's something that you can just download, install, and boot, and it's basically working. Right. But that's, then, that's really it. So open source lets me do that, so I didn't have to create the system, but I just, I gave of myself to say, okay, well, I'm good at distributions. Right. Right? So they're good at Discord and creating this system here that you see. I'm good at distributions. I do NEMS Linux. NEMSLinux.com. Check it out. Um, so I've got that experience. And so I can give back to open source now and say, okay, I've created this thing. And now I'm going to give it back to the community and say, here is this free software that you can install on your Raspberry Pi. Right. And so now Titan benefits from that. The Titan community benefits from that, and anyone who uses Discord benefits from that because it makes embedding Discord chats absolutely easy breezy and beautiful, too. Like, this is all styled to suit our show. Like, have right. you ever seen Discord, like, in a third of the screen like that? It's all part of it, right? Yeah. It's just all CSS, essentially. So That's Excellent. And that's what open source represents. Yes. And that's what NEMS is about. And that's what a lot of different yeah. uh, open source technologies are about. Even Linux itself. Like mm -hmm. it, when you think about Linux and you think about, say, Linux Mint or Ubuntu, um, even going as far as saying Canonical's Ubuntu and saying, well, this is like taking all of the great things that have been created by all these wonderful people who have dedicated countless hours of volunteer time. Mm -hmm. and given it back for free. And then Canonical has said, okay, let's, let's get all these wonderful pieces, let's gather them up and create what's called Ubuntu. Let's release this for free. Right. And give that back to the community. Let's take, okay, now Linux Mint shows up and Zorin OS shows up and they get their arms around it and they say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little better too. I'm right. going to give of myself and... and contribute to this and create Linux Mint and create Zorin OS 15. And I'm going to create these packages that are available for free as well. It's incredible. It just shows that the world is filled with like wonderful people that sure. are just there to help others, right? And by helping others, you're really helping yourself as well. And just everybody's it, I'm just warm and fuzzy about when there's it. A, like when there's a good spirit about yeah. it, like NEMS Linux is really like I'm trying to get that spirit in NEMS Linux where community is coming together and, and supporting this thing and it's really being built up um, based on that. Um, mm -hmm. But really what it comes down to is like I, I don't have the time to create this wonderful OS. Right. But if I were to accumulate all of the technology that's been created by all these wonderful volunteers and create and package up and take my my talents in order to create something that now takes all these things puts them together into a nice little package mm -hmm. that makes it easier for the novice user of a raspberry pi to say hey i want to use titan on my raspberry pi now here you go it's for you it's free it's the, here's my contribution you can put it on your raspberry pi yeah right and that's exactly what everything is. I mean, even Raspbian from the Raspberry Pi project is based on Debian. Right. And it all comes back. It's full circle. It comes back to the same kind of thing where, you know, where did it start? Linus Torvalds. <laughs> I mean, who knows where it starts, right? It's all about this mindset of giving back to community. And I love that. And I love being a part of that. Yeah, as do I. Mm -hmm. Um, so tonight we're going to be looking at some technologies that kind of embrace that mindset. Right. That embrace that, like, I love giving back to community. I love taking things from other developers who have contributed their free time. Right. Putting it all together into a package that makes sense for the, the average user and making it so that it's available to that average user. And, and can, be, can be utilized. 
So we've got, for example, the Pine Book from Pine 64, which we're going to be looking at tonight, which I'm really, really excited about. We're going to be getting into the box right after the break, and we're also going to be looking at some free software coming up in just a couple of moments' time. Stick around. We're going to be getting into this box over here, which looks plain Jane. Totally boring. But inside <laughs> is totally boring, she says. <laughs> <laughs> but inside is the culmination of years and years of wonderful community support coming together into a package that a company has said, hey, we are also going to take all that stuff we're going to put our arms around it. This is Pine 64 saying we're going to embrace this and we're going to give it back. Mm -hmm. That's what the Pine Book represents. Stick around. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv slash shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. cat5.tv slash shirts. break we were kind of hinting at kind of open source and how open source has been giving back to all different projects mm -hmm. and one of those projects comes from pine 64 and i do want to be really clear when we first dig into this box okay. of the pine book because we're all very very excited about what the pine book Yes, but a $99 laptop. Well, yeah, that too. That too, right? Because where can you pick up a laptop for 99 bucks? that's 1080p and ready to go out of the box? Wow. But the key thing to remember here is that what Pine64 has done is not created the video production laptop of the next generation. They haven't taken the the $1300 Asus gaming laptop right. and cr and crunched it down into a $99 Pine book. No, that's not at all what they've done. What they've done is they've taken the A64 platform. So this single board computer that we all know and love, the A64 from Pine64 right. and made it into a form factor that fits into a laptop and created a laptop based on this this architecture. Right. They've taken open source and they've taken all of the like the culmination of so much effort from various people within the community and created a notebook that will work within that space. So this is not your daily driver for watching videos and, and, and doing everything that you do on right. your laptop, typically. It's not a gaming laptop. It's nothing like that. What this is, though, is the next generation, if you will, of the... Sing like a single board computer. Like it's the next generation of like the things you can do with the single board computer. Absolutely. But it's taken it into a form factor of a laptop. Right. But it takes us into that next level of single board computing where they're pushing that envelope and saying, okay, open source has come together. Linux has come together. The community has come together. Architecture. ARM has come together. And open source has come together and said, this is possible. Yes. We can do this for $99. It's not something that's going to replace your day-to-day -day computer. No. It is, however, something that for us developers, us Linux fans even, mm -hmm. we don't have to be Linux gurus. We can be Linux fans and say this is excellent. We've talked about it on the show how Google Drive has revolutionized our need for software because we can actually use cloud software. We can use Google Docs. Right. We can use Google Slides. <laughs> exactly. We, we talked can. about this. I'm pretty sure we covered this. And that can be done on something that is a little less powerful than your, your super powerful right. gaming laptop, right? Exactly. So can I get right over here uh, into the box? Yes. 
And you can join me over here. We are okay. all wireless. So in the packaging, now this is the box, just plain Jane box. Okay. And Sasha, in the box came this 5-volt adapter. Right. Which has the American plug. So is that like European? No, this is American like Canadian. Okay. So 110, 120 volts. But what was the one behind it? Oh, that's just a, a this is like a, a oh, okay. universal. So if you order this oh, for okay. in a in somewhere else in the world, presumably They'll just give they'd, you a different they'd send you a different thing, doodad. right? Yeah, and that makes sense, right? Yeah. So this is five. Uh, oh, it's only 0 0.5 amps, but it's five volts. No, that's the input. The output is three amps, so 3,000 milliamps. So there's a pretty good amount of power coming off of that. But it okay. is five volts, which is interesting. Now, are you ready to get into the box? Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, the culmination of open source up until 2019. Are you ready to get into the box? Oh. And within the box... Not less boring. Oh. <laughs> there is another box. We literally... It's like the Russian dolls or nesting <laughs> what dolls the or whatever. Heck? We seriously, Sasha, have. That's yet. a better looking box. I'll oh, yeah. This has not been quite as abused by right. the delivery system. Can I get into this one? Y yes. Okay. Oh, this one is locked. If you have the key. Bam. That looks a little more. Oh, promising. this is good. Oh, we even lost focus there, which just shows you that. This is good. All Even right. the camera's got, freaking out. We've got some foam. <laughs> Look at this. Wow. All right, what do we got? Oh, I see stickers, guys. We were talking <laughs> about stickers. Those are not the stickers you're getting. <laughs> no, these are mine. Yeah. Pine 64. Look at that. We got two different size Pine 64 stickers that they have thrown in. And we've also, now on this side, you can't see, but they are white. So the same logo. Oh. Okay. But in white, Depending. so this would work really well on my on my darker laptop here. That's cool. Okay, so I do have a letter from I'm I'm assuming TL personally sent this to me. Oh. Dear Piner, this batch of eleven point six inch pine books features a nineteen twenty by ten eighty IPS panel, which is an upgrade to the previous 1368 by 768 display found in earlier iterations. We hope that you find this as a pleasant surprise. Well, I do. Smiley face. A smiley face. Let's jump over <laughs> here onto the camera. So, Sasha, if oh. you move over here, we'll Go just back. jump over and I'll, I'll read you the, the entire letter in its entirety. Okay, so this said, due to the upgrade um, in, in the resolution, open source developers in particular, uh, Anersoul, Ice Snowy, Ayu Fan, Shade Slayer, and Busha. They required extra time to build their respective operating systems right. so that the higher resolution could be supportive, uh, supported. And this resulted in the delivery date being pushed back a couple of weeks. Okay. Now, we felt this here in Canada. Now, we broadcast from Canada, and this took more than a couple of weeks to get here because, uh, well, the border stopped it. Right. And they said, what did they say? They said, Are you ready for this? Okay. Oh, you guess. I'm going, I think I know. What is it? I think that they would not believe at all that a laptop could be ninety nine dollars. Yes. And so they were they like, said, "You're lying." Yeah. Sorry, this can't be. This can't be true. This can't be ninety nine bucks. <laughs> That's what the border police said. So they stopped it, and TL had to put his foot down and say, "Look, we're selling this thing for for ninety nine do ninety nine dollars." <laughs> uh, and that finally uh -huh. let it through. So here we are. A thousand weeks later. Please note that due to the 1080p IPS panel, some existing Pinebook OSs may not work until supported by the higher resolution uh, for the uh, until support for the higher resolution has been added to the operating system. To reflect this, the Pine64 Pinebook wiki site and Pine64 installer utility have been split into two separate categories for the Pinebook and 1080p Pinebook. Oh, so keep that in in mind if you have an older iteration. Right. It's called Pinebook, and now it's called 1080p Pinebook. So that's the 2019 model. Okay. Uh, okay, so please use and install the OS images from the 1080p Pinebook section. We're not going to do that tonight. I'm going to see what's actually like pre-installed on there. Right. Maybe, hopefully, there's something that will at least get us up and running. 
the plastic enclosure goes on that comes with your pine book is a part of the packing material and it's normal for that to break or get damaged during shipment please note that this is not considered a damage to the pine book since the enclosure itself is part of the packaging material and designed to handle and absorb impact that sounds like something that a manufacturer would say like maybe samsung saying do not peel, peel off, off that. Yeah, the plexi thing. <laughs> yeah. the, the thing that is the screen. Don't, Don't worry off. if the shell is broken. Now, in this case, it looks like they have double packaged it in cardboard. First things okay. first, Sasha, this is, if this is it, this is it. Oh, wow. This okay. is a lot smaller than I was expecting, than I, than I thought. I shouldn't say expecting, because I have very little expectations. That's it. That's all that's in the box. So, very well packaged, um, albeit pretty uh, uh pretty bland well yes yeah not not very flashy we're not paying extra for flashy packaging right here we go so this is a lot yeah. smaller <gasps> than i was expecting oh, ladies and gentlemen okay let's see just a sheet go. of paper here yeah okay an eight and, and a half by 11 sheet of paper so Does it is it's about identical. It's all it's a, a little tiny bit, bit narrower, but So the paper the, is a little bit bigger <laughs> than the pine book. Right. So this is just a uh, a 1080p pine book and let's let's Can actually I just get a look touch at it. This. Do you want to actually it. feel this? I'm yeah. not afraid of you dropping it because it is solid state. It has eMMC 16 gigabytes. It has 4 gigs of RAM, I presume, <gasps> possibly 2. I'm going to get into the specs in okay. just a moment's you time, but it, how does it feel? It feels nice. I mean, it feels, it feels slightly heavier than I expected. It's doesn't? Not it's not heavy. But it's I, small. It's Correction, it is two gigabytes of RAM. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get a look here. So on this side, I've got a micro SD slot, which is bootable, so I can install operating systems on that and boot from them. Okay. Um, then I've got a headphone slash microphone jack multi-function. Then I've got USB 2, which is a full-size USB, uh, USB jack, which is quite nice. Over on this side, I've also got another USB 2 jack and a barrel connector DC 5 volts, which is our connection for the charger itself again five volts ten thousand milliamp hours so we're presumably going to get a fair bit of life out of that and what i had expected would be the hdmi port is covered by a piece of electrical tape let's find I out what that's why. about yeah and ladies and gentlemen <gasps> there it is <laughs> oh don't you just want to just look at that that's nice just stare at that. And it does it have that. New. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it has that look of like a lightweight, like portable, right. almost a MacBook Air kind of esque feeling yes. to it. The bezel is quite, I mean, first glances. I mean, this is our first impression too, folks. So my first impression is wow, that looks, it's <laughs> it looks sharp. pretty nice. Yeah. I'm curious about this here. This is a, like Can a piece of... Can you just peel that back? Is that a white electrical tape over now top of... Now you're doing that thing the Samsung phone users did. Yeah. Like, here's is, the thing I should peel. Oh, yeah. This looks like <laughs> something that I should peel off. Let's see what... Okay. So that is literally just a cover for a micro HDMI. I wonder so there's an HD... Is. Why do we have this piece of tape over top? We will never know. But it's gone now, folks, and we will test this over the coming weeks to see if the HDMI works as on? we would expect. Yeah, I sure will. But first, I see there's I a... More tape. Yeah, there's a little bit of tape over top of the 0 0.3 megapixel webcam. Oh, nice. Which is a, a, a very low-resolution camera, but ideal for something like Discord chat or something like that. If you're chatting on Skype with the family... It's perfectly usable. It's not HD like for interviews or video production or anything like that, but right. certainly great for just chat and low, low bandwidth. Yeah. Right? Looking at the keyboard, so first things that I notice here on the keyboard, Sasha, I'm just going to move this aside. So looking at the keyboard, I mean, I'm an Almina typer and I type 180 words a minute, and this drives me nuts. Oh. <laughs> Why? <laughs> First of all, this is where the shift should be. So oh, that's okay. that should be the shift. So shift here. 
Okay. Um, has a pipe and a slash over here. Check this out. The arrow keys are part of my right shift key, and the shift key is, in fact, this little microscopic thing. <laughs> now, I do want to reiterate that what we're looking at here is a $99 arm pine book. Right. So I do want to be clear that what we're looking at is something that is dirt cheap and revolutionary as far as what is currently available on the market. This is, is this button? changing things. That looks like maybe a right click. And then we've got a function. We're, well, we're going to have to see. I, I feel like this is like yeah. bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> Insert bullet points here. <laughs> um, we have a lot of function keys. So this is like a numpad. So if I hold in the function keys, presumably oh, okay. this becomes a numpad. And the slash, where is the slash? The slash? Can I just say, oh my gosh, no. Okay, so if you Kay. you hit you hit this, uh. come on. All right, don't mess with slash. <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> that is bloody nonsense. I found it though. It's but small. you found it. It looks like it requires a function key press in order to press it. Um. Let's go back to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I need to remind myself what this is. I want, to, I want to use this. I want to utilize this pine book for programming. Because right. as a programmer, this is going to be ideal. But this kind of thing, this, is, this drives me nuts. So the slash is actually function slash. Well, and yeah. where the slash should be is a what is that closing called? brace. Uh, okay. Can you guys see that? So the keyboard, I do not. I I you immediate, do not love? I immediately hate it from here. Well, you don't love it. I you hate it. You, okay, you hate no. it. No, when when you Strongly when you screw it. around with slash like that, because slash is something that you use very regularly. regularly. Yes. Yeah. Or pipe, for example, like having to press function pipe, that's not that's not cool. Do you think that there's a reason they did that though? Uh, anybody who knows one, comment below. <laughs> <laughs> so I th I think that keyboard aside. Okay, so I'm not keen on this. We do have USB. Yeah. So I imagine I could use an external USB keyboard if I needed to. Right. Uh, if I really wanted to. Now, for general typing, if I were to get used to the fact that some of the keys are absolutely in the wrong place and that I do not like the fact that slash is here and on a function key. So I have to actually push function slash. That's not cool. And where I think is slash is a closing brace. That's not cool. Um, but that said, okay. Oh, the Yeti wizard said you could fix it by using a custom keyboard layout. Oh. See, now we're getting back into... What are we getting back into here? Op open source. And, and open like source configure and configurability. Yes. So could I close my eyes and forget about the... The, the icons that are printed on the buttons right. and actually pre and reprogram the keys yes. to, to work the way I actually expect them to. I, I don't even mean, this is not me being picky and being like, oh, I right. really want the slash to be there. No. Well, I type 180 words a minute. I'm not screwing around. I'm not holding the function a new, key yes. and pushing a new key. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, so you could probably just wipe their expectations right off the board and download a new one and bingo bango this was not my idea thank you Yeti there you Wizard. go <laughs> i think a remap is definitely in order and that may be a coming feature on category five right <laughs> so out of the box so my first impressions and sasha you can share yours as well but my first impressions are this looks wonderful yes Sorry for the focus there. Uh, camera guy is not paying attention because <laughs> camera guy is digital. Um, it looks really, really good, and it is light. It feels like something that I can just throw in my bag. Right. It's solid state. There's no moving just parts. Kinda, like picture it with that on it. Yeah, you want to oh, put a Pine oh. 64 logo on there? Okay, okay, yeah, okay. I think it's possible. Okay, and that brings up an interesting co a comment that I would share, Sasha, is that what do you notice? 
That it's plain? Not plain, but not branded. It doesn't feel like the stupid Apple logo. Oh, right. Like yes, the that's stupid, true. Like I've got my Lenovo over here with the stupid it's Lenovo logo. Completely customizable. Just, yeah, well, it just looks like, hey, this is no, my netbook. This is my notebook. It says Pinebook it does, on it the says inside. Pinebook. It's just very... It's subtle. Like, yeah, subtle. It's, it's no maintenance. It says, hey, look, I'm a Pinebook, but it's not presumptuous. Yeah. <laughs> Specifications wise, I mean, this has stereo speakers, which we're going to get into. We're going to see if they are as bad as some folks have said. But I mean, that's not really what we're looking at, it being that this is the programmers, the tinkerers mm -hmm. notebook. Um, it does have an ARM 64 bit um, processor. We're going to look at that in a couple of moments time and uh, and two gigabytes of memory but uh we do have to take a really quick break when we come back sasha we're gonna actually fire this thing up yes we're gonna see what comes on it because this is the first time we've ever been in the box right we don't know what's gonna happen as soon as we push go <laughs> like and what is it uh, like wait a few moments we are loading things or whatever and it'll change who knows <laughs> yeah. right yeah. it could be we'll so see. if you want to find out what a new pine book is going to look like out of the box fired up for the first time well you want to stick around and see with us uh what our first impressions are and in addition to that we're going to look at some of the specifications as well and find out uh, just how great this thing is for 99 bucks stick around Welcome back to Category 5 Technology TV. During the break, we were looking at your laptop, <laughs> My, which is... Right. Can I turn it around? I don't, I don't know. know. You Will wouldn't even be it? able to see it, yeah. really. But mine also fails the Robbie test. Well, we are in Canada, and your laptop is, in fact, a French keyboard. So I didn't notice. I clearly am by The enter key is in the wrong spot. The slash key is in the wrong spot, but at least accessible. Right. Um, but, yeah, oh, I, that I don't like French why some of this stuff is in French. That explains <laughs> it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but it does drive me nuts as somebody who has been typing. Like, when I look at laptops and when I buy laptops, I specifically look at the keyboard. Oh, so that's okay. very, very important to me because I just type too fast. And when I move from computer to computer, I don't, I don't want to have to think, okay, I'm on this computer now, so the keys are here. Right. I need to, everything needs to be the same from system to system. That's very, very important when you type as fast as I do. You so... You sort of remind me, sorry, uh, did you ever watch Big Bang Theory? I tried, okay. Sasha. So Sheldon, who, mm -hmm. do you know who that is? I it? do, yeah. He has like a spot on the couch, it's his spot, and he really loves that one spot, and it's like a big deal. I don't okay. really watch the show, mm -hmm. but I feel like you are like that with the Am keyboard. Am I eccentric like him? <laughs> with the keyboard situation, you're like, okay. this is my layout, and I like mine. <laughs> But it makes sense. I'm married. It makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can I just show you, just uh, with the Pine Book here, now I mentioned that it's a little bit smaller than I was expecting, and I say that with almost a pleasant surprise. Like, it's like, wow. In the pictures, I thought it was bigger. Right. Right? So if I look at my uh, Lenovo ThinkPad here and then put this next to it, can you see the difference? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is the difference, folks. So this is not a big ThinkPad. This is just a standard-sized ThinkPad, and I'm, I imagine you can see kind of the, the difference there. But it is quite small. Right. It's very lightweight, and uh, and I'm kind of happy about that as far as, like hey. Like throwing if, it in a backpack. and Yeah, it. if I'm going to be writing or right. coding, if I want to sit at Starbucks with the free Wi-Fi and just sit there coding something, Brilliant, right? Yeah. One of the things I've also gotten into lately is using rem um, Google Remote Desktop. So did, um, this oh. is the Chrome Remote Desktop in order to access my video production system. So using that, I can use a, a less powerful system in order to do things like video editing. Oh, okay. Because I'm actually remoting into a more powerful system, utilizing the resources of that more powerful system and on something much lighter weight, much more portable, much cheaper, much more disposable. 
if you will. I don't like to use the word disposable, but disposable in the sense that, hey, if somebody stole this from me and I was using it like that, you're not losing your video editing. It's all on my more powerful system right. that I access remotely through this. Right. Through Wi-Fi. Smart. It makes sense, right? Huh. So can we fire this up? Can we jump over here, Sasha? Yeah. And you can join me and let's actually see how this thing how this looks All as right. we as we power this on for the very first time. So there's a power button okay. right here, which I presume I'm gonna just push. And let's and see, lights have, come on. lights have come on. Yeah, I do see light. Okay. Do we see anything Nothing on the else. screen? Oh, Nothing? wait, no, there's a little... <gasps> there's a cursor thing. There's a little circle. Nice. Target. Okay. And then... And then what? Nothing. What's next? And then... Do, do, That's do, it? No, there's more. That's there's all there be. is? Come on. Come on. Oh, now there's a tiny dot. Is there? No. Is there? No. No. You were seeing things. No, see, there we go whatever that is this is our first time <laughs> too folks so now some pleasant gobbledygook okay i'm gonna grab my notes here oh, sasha sorry. and and just so i can share a little bit of the f specifications so what we're looking at now the the screen is 11.6 inch and as you know from our note that we had this has been upgraded to 1080p the processor is an a53 64-bit processor the same as the a64 single board computer um as we've shown here today and it looks like it's booted up and ready to go yeah, it says, that's sorry, fantastic we're having trouble getting your well i haven't connected it to the okay. internet yet so that's firefox trying to load up uh, Firefox uh, browser, but I haven't connected it to the Wi-Fi oh. yet. Um, so as we've shown, it's very lightweight, very compact and portable. Uh, now, it comes with some form of KDE Linux installed, pre-installed, but it is compatible with many different Linux distributions, including B, uh, as well as, I should say, BSD, Android as, as well. Like you can imagine, you can install Android on here. Good. on this pine book mm -hmm. that's fantastic um, the gpu is a mali 400 mp2 and it does have two gigabytes of ld uh, lp ddr3 ram um, now let's get a quick look at kind of how things work here now there's no touch screen oh. so you know for 99 bucks you're not going to expect something like that and you can see as i'm touching it yeah it's a little bit it, it's pretty solid like it's right It'll hold up. Oh, yeah. Okay. Once it's there. Okay, so let's get in here. I'm going to use my finger here on the track nice pad. little yeah, the trackpad here, which is multi-touch. Okay, so let's close out. It doesn't seem to support clicking. How do you? Well, I can actually oh. push down on the button. Okay. But it doesn't support, like, touch sense stuff. All right, let's get in to my Wi-Fi. So down here, let's see. Okay, it did take that click. There we go, so we see some Wi-Fi network. So we do have 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi out of the box. It also has Bluetooth 4.0. Uh, as I mentioned, 16 gigabytes of eMMC is built in and is also upgradable. And you can boot from a micro SD card. So if you want to stick like a 128 gig Kingston SS, uh, SD in there, um, that would be a good way to go. And you'd be able to boot from that, put on any operating system. I'm just going to get us onto Wi-Fi here so All let's right. just jump right on to our private network here uh, that's going to take some getting used to i can't just tap right the the touchpad that may be operating system centric it may not be the the system itself pardon me oh <laughs> for goodness sake the backspace key's in the wrong spot okay let's try again I hope there's not a lot of slashes in our password. Our password is giant. And setting network address, if I got the password right, it should be... Yeah, I got the address. Connected. Okay. So we're on. Now the backspace key, first thing I notice is it's the wrong... It's in the wrong spot. So that's not cool. Uh, but that's the keyboard. I mean, you may get used to that. Um... I'm not keen on having to get used to that because I am such a typer, but uh, 
if you're if you're not opposed to that, then I guess that's okay. Uh, that I <laughs> is going to take some getting used to. That I can't just tap to click. Right. See how it's not doing anything. So I'm tapping like I would normally tap my touchpad, and it's not taking the touch. However, there are like push down buttons. So if I push, it clicks. But uh, it doesn't seem to sense when I just tap the, mm -hmm. the touchpad. So there it goes. Okay, so there's a handful of things already kind of pre... Right. Like here. Let's get into category 5.tv. The coolest. At least the enter key is in the right spot. Something... Secure connection failed. Well, why is that? That would presumably mean that the date is wrong on the pine book. So let's take a quick boo. Is the keyboard backlit, Yeti Wizard asked? No. No? No, there's no lighting on the keyboard itself. It is just a... I mean, it feels good, but yeah. you will have to get used to the fact that the keys are in sometimes the wrong place. Um, it says it's December. Now, what's the date today, Sasha? Today is the um, 5th of June. 5th of June, 2019. And this says it is December somethings. How do I get into... All right. Does it say it's a date from before Right click. Existed? Adjust date and time. Yeah, this is, so the data is wrong. That's why I'm getting secure connection failed. Yes. It's not letting me onto my website. Uh, it says that the date is December 8th, 2018. Okay. So keep that in mind. If you get that error message that secure connection is not available, it's, it's just that your clock is wrong. And that's because this is brand new right out of the box, right? Nobody's mm -hmm. ever set the clock before. Sorry, June 5th. 5th, yes. 2019. Yes, 1951. 1951? That's the time. Oh, not the year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoa, we're time traveling. Okay, so 1951. So we're looking at uh, 7... 50. 51. So how do I set the clock on this? It doesn't oh, seem to let me. 752 now. I'm going to apply the date at least. Time zone. What does it say? Time can you, zone. Can UTC? you do that thing where you just get the date and time from the internet? Multi-touch is working. Yes. Okay. I, sh I presume so. So multi-touch is working. So if I put my two fingers down, and I know this is a little difficult for you to see at home, but if I put my two fingers down, I am able to scroll. Oh, so okay. I'm able to scroll this list with two fingers. That's good. Um, so that is a bit of a bonus because sometimes that's not really working out of the box. Let's see if I can find Toronto with a quick search. Oh my goodness. Having the backspace in the wrong spot is going to drive me nuts. I just said Toronto. <laughs> Toronto. There it is. Oh, and I got to click. I actually have to push down with the tactile button. Okay, try again. Now does it come up? Hello? Come on, try again, yeah? It says it's 1.23 a.m. 1.23 a.m., Sasha. Why did it divert? It reverted to December. How do you save your changes? <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Let's go to June 5th, 2019. Apply. Does it, does it now? No, it just jumped. As soon as I hit apply, it jumped to December. April, May, June 5th. Okay. Did that work? bringing back up the calendar. It keeps jumping back to December 2018, Sasha. So that's nonsense. So if I instead, let's try going to baldnerd.com. And is it going to let me there? Yes. 
Okay, so if I go baldnerd.com slash... Now I have to find the slash key here, Sasha. <laughs> Press shift or function. <laughs> Nerdgasms. And you all remember why I'm Use doing this. Use NTP date. Yes. Says Solbu. But I'm saying it's not even setting okay. when I set it using the GUI. So I'm going to click on, in my nerdgasms, so baldnerd.com slash nerdgasms, click on set time and date. <laughs> ah! Can you guys see that? You probably have trouble just... reading that. Do you want to read it to them? Secure connection failed. Because the time and date are incorrect. So this is a problem that we're, that, you know, that we run into on single board computers traditionally. Right. So keep in mind that this is, in all essences, a single board computer. Right. Think about a Raspberry Pi or some single board computer and stick it into a laptop form factor. Right. right? That's what the Pine Book is. Um, Marshman knows, knows how to set the date. The the time and date. Does he now? He does. Here you go, dude. It says... Push the buttons. Hashtag time, date, control, set time, and then you do it. Just like that. <laughs> you just copy and paste oh. it, really, is what I would do. Okay, so I'm going to fade to black, and when we come back, the date and time are going to be magically set. Back from the black. Now... Marshman shared in the chat room that we needed to type a command in the root terminal, which is time date ctl set dash time and then apostrophe 2019 dash 06 dash 05 space 19 colon 57 for 7 57 p.m. and then another apostrophe. Now the apostrophe drove me nuts because the apostrophe is in fact function key minus that's how you find the apostrophe key and it reported to me that it could not do that it said uh, failed to set time automatic time synchronization is enabled so I actually brought up the calendar again as if I was going to adjust the date and time and there's a little checkbox that allows me to disable uh, it says set date and time automatically which I turned off and then I ran that command with the up arrow and it did in fact work and so presumably if I jump back over here now oh yes I have to actually push down and try again date and time are now correct so if we're lucky if things work there we go there. <laughs> Our website, in fact, loads, ladies and gentlemen. So, Yay. let's bring this up. Make that a little bigger. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to get used to that. I have to actually physically push down. So, scrolling down. So, this is the Pinebook out-of-the-box experience. A little bit of configuration to set it up and get up and going. Um, but... All in all, I mean, it is an operational laptop, and truth be told, I understand that this is not my daily driver. This is my, hey, I want to actually code on this thing. So I want to have access to Bosch. I want to have access to Nano. I want to have access to maybe Gedit and things like that. So, you know, all this Internet stuff and whether YouTube plays well, which I am interested in, but... Oh, there we go. Oh. It looks like it's playing actually pretty well on yeah. uh, on YouTube. Where's my cursor? There it is. Let's bring that up full screen. There we go. Okay, full screen. It's choppy. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear that? So if you plugged in a head like a headphone or a set of headphones it would sound better oh yeah and you know what these days sasha oh interesting that uh okay so i'm looking at the volume and the volume is in fact up full blast on everything and it's not very loud so not not a good sound so system at all you're not gonna wake anybody up in the night <laughs> <laughs> well not really a reasonable reply. sound system for video editing or viewing or anything like that however it does look like the frame rate when in windows uh, and i say windows when in why is it there we go okay so i've paused oh now it's unpaused 
There. It's paused. The sound quality is not very good built, mm -hmm. uh, from the built-in speakers. However, as you're saying, Sasha, you're going to use headphones. Yes, there is yeah. a headphone jack. So unlike a iPhone, right. there's an, a headphone jack. But there's Bluetooth 4.0 as well. So, so I don't know about you, but I've really taken to only using Bluetooth headphones these days. Right. And so um, it's going to work fairly well for that type of purpose, right? So if, so I, if I'm wearing my headphones, it's going to work pretty How well. How often would you be really relying on the speakers anyway, except for like a ding? If yeah. Something is okay. Well, let me explain to you what I'm going to, what for me, what a pine book would mean to me. Yes. So it's an ARM architecture. Yes. I program ARM-based distributions. So... To me, I'm going to be in Bash. I'm going to be editing things in Nano. And I'm probably going to have an MP3 playing in the background for music on my headphones. Right. So that I do have music. But it's coming from, like, Bluetooth. Right. It's not coming out of the speakers. I don't care about the desktop. And, in fact, I would be just as happy with this as long as it has Wi-Fi and accessibility to SSH that I could actually just have a terminal mm -hmm. full screen. I'd be quite happy with that for what it is um, but for $99 I mean this looks like and feels like a really good device so looking at the keyboard so people will say well you seem pretty ticked off about the keyboard yeah you know? yeah I really kind of am um, I do not like when keys are not where they're supposed to be it's okay if they're you know like your keyboard is French it makes sense maybe this is Something Klingon. I don't know <gasps> who puts a slash key okay. on an, a function alt key. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Maybe. But that's not a that's not a slight against Pine sixty four. Right. I want to be. It's really a a fine line here because I want to be. I, I want to be clear that this is a really awesome. impressive rig for ninety nine yes. bucks. It is amazing. Yeah. Yes. But. But I want to be clear about what it's not as well. Yes. Right? What it is, is perfect for me sitting in Bash, doing some programming, doing the little bit of things online, maybe like accessing my email and things like that. Okay. It's lightweight. The battery is a 5-volt, 10,000 milliamp hour battery. So I expect that the battery life is going to be really quite reasonable. And so far tonight, we've seen no signs of any kind of battery. wear on the battery. I don't know if it says what kind of battery life. What I see in the bottom icons, okay, it says that there's 97% battery. But it doesn't say, it says it's discharging. It doesn't say how long. Oh. It's going to last for. Do you know an on... Oh, and I see the display brightness. I noticed that Linus had mentioned that there was a no display brightness option out of the box, but I do see a display brightness when I clicked on the battery icon. Does that... Oh, oh, it does brighten it. Oh, yeah. That's where, that's where it should be. That's where it is. And it doesn't say for yeah, like how long the battery is going to last? Yeah, that makes a load of difference. It doesn't say how long. It does say that it's a 97% battery. Right. But that's it. Oh, okay. So, but that's... I mean, hey, we've had it up and running for a good half hour anyways, and just running away. There you go. Yeah. But it's lightweight. It's a solid state. There's no moving parts, so I'm not afraid to, you know, be a little bit rough and tumble with it to some degree. Right. And I closed it on purpose while it was on because I'm curious as to... What happens? What happens when I open it up again. So does it just put itself to sleep, or does it turn itself right off? Well, I see a mouse cursor here. Oh, okay. And it just came back, and it's sitting at a, it's got a clock, and, and it's asking for a password. Um, I didn't time. ever enter a password. Unlocking failed. So there must be a password um, that comes with it that we're going to have to find out what that is <laughs> out of the box. <laughs> but you can, of course, uh, visit the Pine64 website, pine64.org, in order to get um, other distributions for it. You don't, you're not limited to just what's uh, included on the Pine book, but you can install various other operating systems as well. Mm -hmm. uh, tons of open source platforms that are available for it and lots of people working on making it, this work yes. really, really well. But for what it is, hey, for 99 bucks, You could give it to your impressive. kids easily to play on and, you know. I, 
Uh, yeah, I kind of right. feel that way. Like, yeah. I feel like, as a programmer, this is a really nice thing to just kind of carry around with me. Yeah. But, yeah, for the kids, right. for accessing Discord and various, like, online stuff, a lot of right. games are on, like, Chrome. So install Chrome on it, and there you go. There's your, I mean, it's not even a Chromebook. This is a full Linux laptop. That is great. For 99 bucks, and, uh, you know, there you go. Can you see how Bam. sleek that is? Sweet. That's the Pine Book from pine64.org. And, of course, I'll give you a hot link at cat5.tv slash pinebook. We've got to jump over to the newsroom. Sasha, if All you're right. ready for me. Let's do this. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Researchers at security firm Intezer say that they've discovered an advanced piece of Linux malware that has escaped detection by antivirus products and appears to be actively used in targeted attacks. Effective immediately, flying drones in Canada without a license could mean fines of $1,000 for recreational users and $5,000 for commercial users. The Australian National University has fallen victim to a fresh breach in which intruders gained access to significant amounts of data stretching back 19 years. And look out, Robocop is already starting to think. Scammers who use dating sites to trick people into handing over cash are being spotted using artificial intelligence. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Researchers at security firm Intezer say that they've discovered an advanced piece of Linux malware that has escaped detection by antivirus products and appears to be actively used in targeted attacks. Hidden Wasp, as the malware has been dubbed, is a fully developed suite of malware that includes a Trojan, rootkit, and initial deployment script. At the time Intezer's post went live, the virus total malware, malware service indicated Hidden Wasp wasn't detected on any of the 59 antivirus engines it tracks, although some have, begun, have now begun to flag it. Timestamps in one of the 10 files in Tezzer analyzed indicated it was created last month. Some of the evidence analyzed, including code showing that the computers it infects are already compromised by the same attackers, indicated that Hidden Wasp is likely a later stage of malware that gets served to targets of interest who have already been infected by an earlier stage. It's not clear how many computers have been infected or how any earlier related stages get installed. With the ability to download and execute code, uplo upload files, and perform a variety of other commands, the purpose of the malware appears to be to remotely control the computers it infects. That's different from most Linux malware, which exists to perform denial of service attacks or mine cryptocurrency. One of the files uploaded to Virus Total, a bash script that appears to have been used for testing purposes, led in Tezzer researchers to a different file. The new file included the username and password for accounts that appear to have already been added to give attackers persistent access. This evidence led in Tezzer to believe the malware gets installed on machines that attackers have already compromised. It's common for advanced malware to come in two or more stages in an attempt to keep infections from from being detected and to prevent unintended damage. Both Eclam AV and ESET Nod32 antivirus for Linux are able to detect the malware. Interesting. So I was just under this idea that malware just doesn't exist for Linux. I was <laughs> like, it's perfect. We do kind of have that almost complacency. Yeah. And that comes from the fact that most Linux users are not running as root, or to put it into Windows terms, administrator. Right. Right. So if you got a malware infection, it's probably going to only impact the user that you're currently running as. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, malware developers have not really focused on Linux because of the fact that they can only gain access as that user. Right. But that said... We now live in a world where a lot of Linux servers are online and 
have shared user access. And some of those shared users have access to shared resources. So you get a WordPress site, for example, who's, uh, who's using a, a caching software that they're able to compromise through an SQL injection. Huh? 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 <laughs> through an SQL injection and can then download this malware. And that malware can then become part of that system and in that user space. So it may not gain root level access, right. administrator access, but it has access to the, the user level. So right. then you get the situation where, okay, you've got malware that can propagate into websites and file systems and, and other files within a system. And you may not even know that it's happening. Right. Well, I mean, if antivirus isn't seeing it, then how really would you know? Right. And because it's multi-tiered. Yeah. So you think about this and you think, well, why would they have it sent out in stages? So if I gave you something that here's a virus, we'll say, we'll call it a virus, but really malware. Yeah. So here's a piece of malware. Take oh, this thank, from me. Thank okay. you. And you think that that's pretty benign, but then this grows into this. Okay. Right. So now this is this thing. Okay. Right. And then your mal anti-malware comes along, or antivirus, for lack of uh, a modern term. Your right. antivirus says, oh, that's malware. So let's destroy that. Get rid of it. Right. And now, it's because it's multi-tiered, multi... -tiered, multi it still lives over there. It's still over here. This right. is the piece that's actually active and this doing is something just bad. Like the red hair. That is, is the, like the decoy. Yeah, but it's also right. the deployment mechanism. Right. So now we've got something over here that's running that the mal anti malware can't detect because it's actually a, a caused by that thing that it can detect. Right. Right. So now this thing's running. This thing's doing all kinds of things to your system. And you don't even know that it's happening because the anti-malware already got rid of phase one and didn't even know about phase mm. two. So that's kind of the scenario where, hey, it's detected. They've figured out something that is a result of something else. Wow. Now, is it typical that some antivirus companies may not be able to find or see something in a scan until after like because this seems kind of new right so now they mm -hmm. know about it everybody will be able to detect it right everybody's jumping on that yeah right and anything like it is that the way it works is it is it yeah heuristics do play into it right. so heuristics being a mechanism to read the uh how would you say to read the intentions of a program Okay. So to understand, so heuristics look at a program and figure out what does this program do? And if this program does something that's not quizzical yeah. or somehow possibly malicious, then maybe we need to flag that. And so then heuristics says, let's send that to our detection center right and then the detection center is when real people get involved and, and yeah. they say so for ESET this is Slovakia's office or Quebec's office and says right. okay we're gonna look into this code that it has now sent us and we're gonna investigate this and see what it's actually doing and figure out if it's benign or if it is in fact malicious and this is where Kaspersky got into trouble because Kaspersky's software was running in government offices in the, in the United States and it grabbed hold of NSA software that right. was being used by the NSA in order to infiltrate um, citizens, mm -hmm. computers. So, <laughs> of course, the NSA says, well, that's us, we're the government, and we have every right. The anti-malware says, this is malware. Yeah, this is... Trump. And so then all of a sudden, the government of America says Kaspersky is out of the store shelves, right? right. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, so, so you, you got to see the, the big picture and, and that's exactly what happens in these kinds of cases. So, wow. but it's, it's interesting. And I don't know whether, am I alone in my feeling like do, 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 Linux is untouchable. You know, I just automatically assumed Linux is very much touchable, yeah. especially in a world that we live in where social engineering is a big concern. Right. Because whether you're on Windows, Linux, Mac, it doesn't matter if you are tricked into thinking that that email is legitimate and I need to follow that link and enter my password. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's the human component. 
And right. no amount of antivirus can protect you from that. Right. So, you know, there are anti-phishing programs that will protect you against those types of infiltrations. But who stops the phone calls? Who right. stops those infiltrations or the malicious adware? Yeah. Right. And when I say adware, I mean like going onto a website and an advertisement pops up that seems legitimately to say your computer is infected. Click here to inoculate your, you know, yeah. whatever. Or, or the email that says, here's your password. I know your password and therefore um, send me Bitcoin. Right. I've hacked your computer. Right. No, you hacked Bell Canada back in 2016 and gained access to their entire database of users and now you have all of their usernames and passwords. Right. True story. And so with that information now, with that data, I can now take it to Sasha and say, haha, you're a Bell user. Yeah. Here's your password. I've hacked your computer. I know your password. And so it convinces me. Social engineering. It uh, tricks me into thinking, oh, yeah, that is my password. I better give you money. So I had better. They obviously have hacked my computer. Right. No, they hacked and Bell. They, right. And they will only need this money one time. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's all a trick, folks. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh. Along that vein, Have I Been Owned is a great service that will help you to right. determine in those kinds of cases whether or not you're email account or other accounts have been compromised on third-party sites. And this is exactly why we warn, don't use the same password on this site and that site and this site. If you use the same password as your online banking and your Twitter account on Joe Schmo's forum, and then Joe Schmo's forum gets hacked, and now the hackers have access to that username and password, right. what are they going to do? They're going to try All of the banks. Twitter, the yeah. bank. Yeah. They're going to send you an email and say, I've got your password and I've hacked your computer. Send me Bitcoin. Right. Right. And you're going to say, oh, that is my real password. They know my password. Obviously, they have legitimately hacked me. Yeah. Don't use the same password on multiple sites, on multiple services. That's just common sense at this point the only but I way have to reiterate the that. only way not to use the same password on different sites is to have a password manager because truly because i mean because we're not doing password one two three right. password one two three four right password twitter one exactly we're not doing that we need to use a password manager for sure right so do that are you doing that i am 60 percent of the way there in other words, she knows what she's supposed to do, and she's not doing it. I am almost there. Do it, there. folks. You're almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> I, I have a password manager, and I've been she's saving. She's not there. I'm not there. She's not there. Please don't hack me. <laughs> but if you get an email that says, here's your password, just know that it's probably not legitimate. I'm just going to call you. Yeah. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Effective immediately, flying drones in Canada without a license could mean fines of $1,000 for recreational users and $5,000 for commercial users. There are two, ty different, two different types of licenses now offered by Transport Canada, basic and advanced. The basic category is meant for people who never fly in controlled airspace or within 30 meters horizontally of bystanders. The basic category requires passing a $10 online exam, registering with Transport Canada, marking the drone with its registration number, and carrying the pilot certificate whenever the drone is in use. The advanced category requires all of the above, plus an in-person flight review and special permission from air traffic controllers whenever flying in controlled airspace. Users must be 14 years of age or older to take the basic exam, and they must be 16 years of age or older to take the advanced exam. Drones that weigh under 250 grams are exempt from licensing, and those that weigh more than 25 kilograms have their own set of rules. Transport Canada also reminds pilots that drones need to be flown where the pilot can see them at all times, below 122 meters, at least 5.6 kilometers away from airports, and no less than 1.9 kilometers from heliports. Okay. So that's all kind of common, commonsensical in that I mm -hmm. think to myself, if you're flying a drone, you have to be responsible for it, right? Like you just, because there are people out there just 
not d- doing the safe practices, right? So yeah. registering it makes sense to me. And, and I think it kind of alludes to the fact that we, as we want to fly drones, mm-hmm. need to start with the toy drones. Yes. So if you, if you have that desire, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to fly drones. Mm-hmm. And we're using the, uh, just so you know, we're using the term drones, but that covers and we're talking about benign quadcopters helicopters those kinds of toys and consumer commercial devices we're not talking about uh, mechanisms of war or anything like that no we're talking about things that we would fly in our local park for fun yeah Yeah. Um, so that that in mind if you are feeling that inkling to want to fly a quadcopter a drone um, then start with something that is under 250 grams so that makes sense i mean that's a toy it makes sense on a lot of levels because if you're new at flying one you probably don't want to crash an expensive one that's that's true too in and of itself and it is tricky to fly and and you have to you have to be able to get your head around the spatialness of flying a quadcopter right i mean when i first was starting to fly um it was difficult to learn the fact that because I'm used to remote control cars right and remote control cars you can always see the direction that it is traveling a drone you cannot always see the direction that is traveling it can sometimes be very disorienting because up might be down left might be right it depends on which way it's oriented it depends on what mode you're flying in whether you're flying in headless mode or not and whether you're flying with a GPS or not. I mean, there's so many different variables. So learn on something that's under 250 grams. It's a toy. Right. And, and we don't say that. Don't think of a toy as a kid's thing. It's not the kid's drone. It's we've got to learn how to fly safely before we're ready for that next step. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I think it makes sense that people have to read through a set of rules and maybe take a test. It's probably an easy it, test. Here in Canada, only $10. I mean, yeah. that's not so bad. My biggest drone is uh, about one and a half kilograms. And it can hurt. If It, it can really yeah. hurt. I had it happen once where I, I had a hard landing and I didn't kill the engines and, I, and I, I screwed up. I made a mistake. Okay. And it was upside down. And so I ran up to it. And it was upside down. But what I didn't realize is that the motors were still intending to fly. Oh. So when Did I you... grabbed a hold of the landing gear, I think I grabbed it with one hand because I had only, I had the other hand on the controller. Okay. And I grabbed the landing gear on the ground with one hand. And I picked up. And this is a big, like a, uh, think of a Phantom 3 or something like that okay. from, from DJI. Uh, and, and, because it was in flight flight mode, it immediately righted itself. So when I picked it up, it went and started spinning at about a million RPMs and sliced my arm. One of the one of the propellers hit my arm and sliced it. Right. So like that was a real learning experience, and I was like, eh. I learned the hard way that right. you do not grab a drone that is presumably o- offline but is not from upside down and, and just think that you can pick it up. Right. Don't. Yeah. See. You know? Now, had you taken a ten dollar course or a ten dollar test, I don't know if it covers. Maybe that. it would cover that. Maybe it would be in a multiple choice. But I did realize <laughs> that maybe I'm not as proficient as I thought I might be. Right. I definitely realized that, hey, I, I'm still a rookie. I'm still learning by mistake. And that could have been worse. I mean, it could have been one of my kids run up and grab it. Exactly. Right? Uh, it was me and I was on my own. And so, you know, that was good. But it gave me a good nick on the arm. Yeah. And, and I was bleeding and everything, you know. So <laughs> but you'll that never was just do the propeller again, hit me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll never do it again. And, and so, you know, it's, it's like, okay, let's, let's learn on something that's a little safer, something that's a lot light, lighter weight. Because when you get into that kind of weight, like one and a half kilograms, and it has power, right? right? It flipped itself. Like I had no control over it when it flipped itself over. Something that was a toy, I absolutely could have had control over. Right. I could have just grabbed it and picked it up. And the, the propellers could have been spinning. And I would have been just like, huh, it's spinning. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. like uh, I would have had the control over exactly. it. something more like large and, and powerful. I, I didn't have the control over it. So, yeah. you know, that's a bit of a learning experience for me. I've always found it interesting. I would love to, to use a drone to, you know, examine like the inside of some of the caves and some of oh, the hiking yes. trails and stuff that, yeah. right but then at the same time i think to myself well if a drone had a camera on it wouldn't it be great to like go to an outdoor concert and get closer but then that's but then probably you're close to people exactly that's, dangerous. that's so dangerous yeah. and and i would i would see all of the steps on how that could end in disaster yeah. but perhaps others wouldn't and now if you have to have it registered then you can trace it back to somebody who has yes hurt someone with a drone at it well and presumably by registering your drone yeah so having a registration mark labeled on the drone yeah if you did lose it hopefully you'd be able to recover it sure. i have almost lost my drone my big drone once oh and it actually kind of put me off of flight it really kind of scared me away from flight because sometimes they can pick up signals from nearby interference right and to have your drone all of a sudden take off you know that's yeah it's scary that's six hundred dollars Dry, uh, flying Bye. away from you <laughs> you know and it's like no come back please i know you hurt me the once but <laughs> yeah your gps is wrong listen to me please <laughs> so you know hopefully maybe etching your your <laughs> number into it would help you to be able to recover one of those yeah or at least get you insurance on it or something yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> The Australian National University has fallen victim to a fresh breach in which intruders gained access to significant amounts of data st stretching back 19 years. The top-ranked university said that it noticed about two weeks ago that hackers had accessed staff, visitor, and student data, including names, addresses, dates of birth, phone numbers, personal email addresses, emergency contact details, tax file numbers, payroll information, bank account details, and passport details. It said the breach took place in late 2018, the same year it fessed up to another lengthy attack. Academic records were also accessed. University officials say, quote, the systems that store credit card details, travel information, medical records, police checks, workers' compensation, vehicle registration numbers, and some performance records have not been affected, end quote. The news comes less than a year after the school admitted its network has been hit by a months-long attack. At the time, the university said that it had been working in partnership with Australian government agencies for several months to fend off the attack. Vice Chancellor Brian Schmidt admitted that if the university had not made upgrades last year in the wake of the early 2018 attacks, this most recent breach would have gone undetected. Schmidt described the attacker as a sophisticated operator and said the university has no evidence that research work has been affected. <laughs> so so, so what makes me giggle about that yes. is like there's this huge long list of the things that have been compromised and they retaliated oh, by yes. giving let a, me tell a you what list. hasn't been compromised yeah. Yeah. oh but d did you know this hasn't oh, been yes. looked at yet yeah yeah and your our logs of the janitorial service has not been compromised not con see it's You're safe see yeah bank account information however <laughs> we live in a very interesting time a very dangerous time where we're still we have a lot of people working in the industry that are still based on the old mindset. Okay. A lot of people who still think we don't. Oh, we don't need firewall. We just we just need antivirus. No, hello. When was the last time you heard of a virus outbreak when it comes to computers? Think about that for a second, and right. then you start to realize, holy cow. I Natus, back in the 1990s. That was huge. Boot sector viruses, huge. But these days, when was the last time you heard of a real outbreak of viruses? So then you get into the old mindset of thinking, okay, well, we only need antivirus. We don't need firewall and ransomware protection and anti-malware, uh, anti anti-data theft. We don't need um, enterprise inspector or, you know, uh, endpoint um, 
and endpoint um, detection and things like that. Yeah. These are not these are not new trends, Sasha. Right. These are not new things that the anti malware or the antivirus companies have brought out to sell you more product. You know what I mean? Like, right. Like the whole endpoint inspector or um, when you think about things like, uh, like enterprise monitoring and being able to monitor packets and things like that. It's mm-hmm. not just a trend. It's not just to sell you more product. This is because attacks have become very sophisticated. Right. And they've become so that antivirus won't detect it. Right. I mean, we just learned that... Th- but like even Linux is getting, you know, malware and you know, like it's, <laughs> it's yeah. So things can go undetected. You need to be more secure. And be the foo better. is even bringing up Baltimore in our chat room, and, and we're not even oh, going to go there. Wow, yeah. Because Baltimore uh, is an entire situation of. Uh, uh, you have an IT administrator who is warning you of these threats. Like, am I the person who's warning you of these threats right now? And Listen. you're, and you're thinking like, oh, well, I don't want to spend the money. <laughs> Can like, we do a follow-up? Baltimore up? is that. Can we do a follow-up on the Baltimore situation at some point? I would really like to know where they are right now. No, wait six months and see if they've learned their lesson yet. Okay. Right. But then again, it's like. <laughs> I kind of laugh because it's like, uh, you know, I could sell you the right product, but would you pay your bills on time? It's like, there's so much compounding issue there. Right. Oh, it's tricky. But when it comes to malware and and the whole old mindset, you just can't have that mindset anymore. Right. And prevention is much easier than trying to clean up the mess after the fact. You're absolutely right. I say proactive prevention. Proactive in that I've, I've... set up something to be able to detect and thwart these types of infiltrations right at the at the endpoint um i'll be honest my website came under attack today oh this very day it happened and because of my proactive measures i was alerted to this fact before it became an issue okay i was able to patch against the very thing that they were trying to exploit and, and I'm talking, this is not a small attack. And sometimes this happens and, and I need to be ready for it. And, and you need to be ready for it too, because it could happen to anyone. But for me, so this was about 600 individual IP addresses. 600 Oy. individual computers attacking my website all at once today. And so I started, what did I do? I monitored the packets. Mm -hmm. I started watching, what are they trying to do? What is happening here? It's not a virus. These are scripts that are attacking various aspects of my system. Right. My server. They're trying to gain access to my server, essentially. Yeah. They're trying to install applications that will allow them back-end access so that they can have root-level access to my server and compromise accounts and things like that. Well, I'm not going to have it. So... Of course, I'm alerted to the fact that these things are happening and immediately counteracting their measures. But if you're not, if you're Baltimore and you're just sitting there... Not paying attention. Completely complacent and to the point of idiotic. Uh, And I apologize to anyone who is watching that is uh, involved in it. Yeah. It really, I mean, you know. You absolutely know. Like, there have been some serious mistakes there. Oh, And when it comes to cybersecurity, like, this is just, it's not a game anymore. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that it was, like, bots and stuff. It would have been, right? It starts with bots. Right. So, understand that. Yeah. It starts with bots. Okay. And then it develops into people paying attention once they have access. Bots are created by malicious parties in order to find Mm -hmm. exploits. Once those exploits are found, those exploits are either exploited not likely those exploits are sold right okay if i'm an attacker what am i in it for people say well why do people attack money money Money. yeah no, so what no, what are they going to do so if i find a samba share at a government office that is wide open because they're stupid because they still have like because they still have um eternal blue unpatched on a server okay 
-hmm. This is the NSA exploit that has compromised Baltimore. And Baltimore has... S oh, it makes me angry. <laughs> Baltimore has accused the NSA. Don't be stupid. This is an exploit that was r revealed two years... Well, I'll be honest, a year ago. Okay. A year ago, it was, it was absolutely patched and fixed. And a, a year and a bit ago... ESET had already patched against Eternal Blue. Okay. So if you are still in 2019 susceptible to Eternal Blue, that's you are doing cybersecurity wrong. Yeah, that's okay? your fault. It basically. is absolutely yes. your fault. So yes, the NSA had to do with Eternal Blue. Yes, the NSA was utilizing Eternal Blue to compromise its citizens of the, of the, the United States of America. But if you are still unpatched in 2019 against that threat that has been patched against for over a year, then you are doing something yeah, wrong in cybersecurity. That one's on you. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. you, can't, you can't fall back on that. Mm-hmm. I feel oh. bad for getting you all riled up. I'm sorry. All right. I'll just stop. Oh, no, I, could, it's, it's, I feel like Jeff right now. I could get riled up. But the truth of the matter is it's a serious concern, and you see it more than most. So for you... Yeah. Like you're very aware of how prevention can save a a million headaches and dollars. Yeah. <laughs> proactive prevention. Exactly, and that's it. Proactive. Mm -hmm. And and it's not even proactive anymore when it comes to something like internal blue. Well, that, yeah, that's the that thing. is ridiculous. If you're just figuring that out now, you're behind the times. If you have Windows XP anywhere, yeah, you're doing cybersecurity wrong. Okay. Okay. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Look out. Robocop is already starting to think. Scammers who use dating sites to trick people into handing over cash are being spotted using artificial intelligence. A neural network has analyzed profiles, messages, and images from real dating, real dating data to get, a better, to get better at spotting fakes. It sampled age, gender, and ethnicity, as well as the language people use to describe themselves. The results of the research are slightly mind-blowing. The AI system proved accurate at spotting scammers and fakes in a whopping 93% of cases. Computer scientists in the UK, US, and Australia collaborated on the AI-based system, which found that those making fake profiles were more likely to be men, 60%, and had an average age of 50. The system was trained using almost 15,000 profiles from a free dating website. The computer science project used the data from the service because it publicly posts fake profiles when they're discovered. Ultimately, the team hopes to create an early warning system that can spot scammers as they set up accounts and begin the process of contacting victims. The researchers said scams on dating sites and apps were hard to tackle because they were usually not large campaigns and were not generated automatically. The researchers suggested their methods could be harder to get around than some of the current approaches, which rely on blacklists and other basic technical tricks to thwart repeat offenders. They added, quote, we aim to more broadly examine the available data online on online dating fraud, seeking information actionable for enforcement and other countermeasures, end quote. How interesting that they'd be using AI for this type of... This is a great protection, tool. if you will. Yes, especially because we know like humans are the weakest link as far as like protection goes sure. against things like that. <laughs> Not that we've learned that today. <laughs> yeah. um, and I guess it's predictable when people are setting up face, fake past profiles, but maybe they don't realize how predictable they're being. Uh, true. Yeah, but right? isn't it interesting that they can use AI now? Yeah. Like AI is good enough at detecting these types of threats mm -hmm. that, or uh, threats, I say, I'm still stuck on threats, but um, <laughs> these types of malicious people that right. are trying to compromise, again, it comes back to social engineering because they're tricking people, people. on dating sites into providing financial money. information. It could not, it, maybe it's not even money. Maybe it's just like accidental access to their bank accounts and things you think it's stupid you think that it doesn't happen but it's, it's like definitely i can picture i'm it. on a dating site oh i see that you like dogs what's right. your dog's name 
Oh, yeah, exactly. What's your dog's name, Sanja? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. First password hint on the banking site. Yeah. Right? Pet's name. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's exactly. a true story. True story, right? Yeah. Those kinds of things and actually happen people these on days. I mean, some people aren't vulnerable on dating sites, but people who are vulnerable are sometimes on dating sites. So it's good that they're being given protection. Yeah. Uh, vulnerable, I don't even know. It, like, vulnerable as in... Easily. Maybe just... You could... You you want to just open up to somebody. Exactly. Like, what's your dog's name? Right. Oh, tell me about your life. You want to... You know, you need to yeah. interact with people. You guys are going down. Get our, to know people. Our AI is getting you. And the AI is going to stop that nonsense. Smash Presumably, you. the dates are going to get a lot better, folks. <laughs> They're going to stop stealing your monies. Just another, you know, cybersecurity threat. There's another one yeah. that comes up tonight. What a fun news week this has been. <laughs> yeah, but you don't think of it as cybersecurity. It is, but though, it is. because social engineering is. And that's where it comes back to, uh, you know, I started talking about, you know, antivirus versus anti-malware. And it's like, well, anti-phishing mm -hmm. is a big deal these days. The protection against social engineering attacks is something that is very, very important. Because users in a network, like if you've got a business with 100 people, you don't have time to <laughs> make sure that everybody is smart when it comes to social no. engineering attacks to the person who says, what's your dog's name? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm on a dating site and somebody's asking me about my life and that's interesting. Yeah. And I want to interact with this person and see if they are what, also interesting. What that person actually would say instead of what's your dog's name is like, my dog's name is this. And then never ask you so that you like take the bait. And you're like, oh yeah, me and my dog sure. Lucy went for a walk. Yeah. What's your sign, babe? Yeah, exactly. Right? And it's like, okay. Your sign. Yeah. <laughs> it happens to be one of your banking questionnaires. Yeah. I want to make sure we're not related. What was your mother's maiden name? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> wow. Ding, ding, ding. All right, I'm going to jump over to CoinGecko. This is what the, uh, the cryptocurrency market looked like as of about 17, 1800 hours on June 5th. 2019 bitcoin well everything is actually down bitcoin has been yeah. like have you ever volatile. been on one of those roller coasters that's just like this yeah yeah volatile is the the word but it's more like just zoop 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 you may as well just like draw a bunch of squiggly lines because it's down another 906 dollars us this week this week Hi. litecoin is down 103 uh, no, pardon me. It's down thirteen dollars and thirty cents U.S. to one hundred and three forty-eight. Uh, Ethereum is uh, at two hundred and forty-six dollars and nine cents U.S. and Monero is at eighty-six fourteen. Again, everything's down. Torque is at zero point seven seven ten thousandths of a cent, and our guy Turtle Coin is trailing along behind the rabbit at zero point nine nine ten thousandths of a cent. Remember, the cryptocurrency market is all, always, always active and volatile, and we're seeing that it is very up and down. So, like, I mean, this week it's down nine hundred dollars on a Bitcoin. Right. So, if you buy one, will it Go jump back up? up? Nine hundred dollars next week. Like that's w what we've been seeing. It's, it's been a thousand dollars up, a thousand dollars down, a thousand dollars up, a thousand dollars down. You'd almost, like, if we you were don't know gambling by buying Bitcoin, you'd almost want to just get right in on the trend and like buy then sell, then buy then sell. Then exactly. Buy. But don't every not, week. This is, yes, this we're not is making. Not advice. Yeah, we're not making financial <laughs> advice. But we're just jokingly saying every, that's what the trend has been. Every week and just be yeah. watching and somehow have the <laughs> premonition to know when the down is going to happen. Basically, you have to be an alien with telekinesis right. and superpowers. Exactly. And that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. 
Thanks for being here with us this week. Now, we do still have some show left, so stick around. When we come back, we're going to be looking at a piece of software, perhaps retro gaming, that is celebrating how many years? 35 years. And we're going to show you how to get it up and running on any Linux computer. Stick around. From Ameridroid.com. They pointed this out to us this week. Well, this week is a very special week for a particular retro game. Tetris turns 35 years old. Can you believe it? Happy birthday, Tetris. Does it make Holy. me feel old? I remember when Tetris was new. I remember playing Tetris with my grandma. Yeah. We played it on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Those were great <sighs> memories. Yes. Tetris and Othello. And that's, uh, that's, that's my memory. See? Where did you first try Tetris? We have, we even buy Tetris, like we have Tetris on like a handheld yeah. that is just Tetris. Right. It's just like black boxes that fall on a gray screen. Yeah. Like retro I all the way. I love Tetris. I can't remember the first time I played it. I feel like it's been around almost my whole life, so. Yeah, it pretty much has. Yeah. Right? Because you're, what, 36 then. <laughs> yeah, no, 38. Okay, Aww. I know, I know. I was just trying to win points. Yeah, no, um, won. you won them. Fantastic. <laughs> 35 years old is Tetris, and we're going to install it on a Linux machine in three seconds flat. Are you ready for this, folks? This comes to us from Ameridroid.com's Amera blog. I'm going to go sudo apt install. Actually, first I'm going to go sudo apt update. We're going to throw that in there for us uh, because, first of all, I want to make sure that my app repositories are up to date. So with that, now I'm going to type sudo once it's done. I think, how many repositories do I bloody well have? Sinalera has about 3,000 of them. Oh my goodness, can you guys tell that I've been trying to find a Linux video editor that works? <laughs> All right, sudo apt <laughs> install, and the program that I want is called Tint. Now figure that one out. It's called Tint, but it is Tetris. Tetris. Tetris for the masses, folks. It's already installed. It's done and done. And notice I'm doing this through my terminal, but you can install, you can run this on any Linux server, or as Ameridroid pointed out, you can install this, run this on a single board computer brilliantly. And of course, here I am on my laptop, which is running Linux Mint. It says, choose your level to start. Oh, is one the lowest I can go? <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Okay, oh, go, 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 go. Okay, K on my keyboard is going to rotate. So let's uh, let's throw that down there. Okay, let's uh, let's see how Robbie yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here we are celebrating 35 years of Tetris, and it looks like this is oh. antique for sure. This is running in my Linux terminal. I absolutely love it. Thank you to Ameridroid.com for pointing <laughs> this one out to us. It's called Tint, and you can install it from your apt repositories. Go, 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 Robbie, go! Yes! Do it. And oh. again, this is running in my terminal. I can install this on any server, <laughs> because absolutely you need a boss key. Am I right, folks? This is oh, amazing. oh, what no, I, wa do? I wanted to go to the right and I pushed down. I am so messed up now, Sasha. Oh, no. Ah, that is the end game right there. Oh. You guys thought that, that the longer. Avengers was end game? No. This You'll, is end game. You lost That's the end of it. Hey, <laughs> yeah, uh, Ameridroid.com. I mentioned them. Make sure you check out their website. Check out Amera blog. And incidentally, check out their coupon code. You have it there somewhere, but it I is... I do. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I'm, the coupon code is... Dun, 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 Cat 5 TV Supporter. Cat 5 TV Supporter. All one word. And that will prove that you support Cat 5 TV. <laughs> and Thank in you. so doing, you will in fact receive a discount on checkout of any single board computer purchase at Ameridroid.com. Thank you uh, for everyone for tuning in this week and for pitching in 
through our various ways of being able to support Category 5 TV, whether it's through our Amazon links, mm -hmm. our other partner links at category5.tv slash partners, whether you're setting, uh, whether you've set up this week a Patreon profile or you've been doing that for some time, that's a well, great way to support us. Right, exactly. Might get a wrap out of the deal. That apparently is <laughs> happening. <laughs> yeah, you're letting the cat out of the bag. Yeah, there are all kinds of perks. Like, for example, um, Sasha and I are going to have to, we are honor bound now to, in fact, produce a, mu a music video of us rapping. And that is because our supporters have said that is what they want. And we absolutely have to give the people what they want. Exactly. That's who we are. And you only get that stuff if you support us on Patreon. And it's only a dollar a month. You can give more if you like, but that's all we ask. And that's a way to support Category 5 Technology TV. It's a great um, thing that we're, that we're building here. And, you know, after 12, 12 years of doing this, it's continuing to grow. Yeah. And so we do call it a, a building process, and we're continuing to build it and continuing to grow it. And it's through your support that we're able to do that. Uh, but that's all the time that we have for this week. I want to uh, remind you to check out um, Category 5 on Twitter as well. I'm Robbie Ferguson on Twitter. You can follow me. I will follow you back. We're also on Facebook. We're on YouTube as Category 5 Technology TV. And you'll also find us at linuxtechshow.com, which reroutes to our edited down version of Category 5, which is cool. Right. The it, newsroom right. is a little 24-minute segment that you can just tune into once a week. And you don't have to watch all of the blabbing around it. All of the stuff that I talk about, like all the, uh, all that stuff. No, if, that you, stuff if you just want all Sasha all the time. All news. LinuxTechShow.com is where you want to subscribe to. <laughs> uh, we're also on Plex and Cody channels, uh, but you have to get the channels installed on your Plex or Cody. Right. Which you can do through our GitHub, github.com slash cat5tv. And of course, everything comes together, including RSS feeds and everything else, through our main website, category5.tv. We hope to see you there. Make Make sure you interact with us on Discord as well, because that's a lot of fun. Do that. It is fun. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week, Sasha. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Take care, everybody. See you. Bye.